so. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, it's great to meet you, and I want to begin our conversation. We're coming up on the four-year anniversary of the pandemic. How did you get through the pandemic, and how did it change you? Oh, wow. I would say that um, how it changed me for the better was I started reflecting more on my home, my time, and how I spent um, finding joy. Because many a times um, we look outside of our world for our not only just entertainment, but um, to externally motivate us and 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 bring us joy and keep us going. But at the same time, when you're at home, it's an internal pleasure that you have to seek and you have a you really have a choice then you can seek those things that bring you joy or you can you know you can look at the half the glass half empty and say oh i wish i could go to a movie theater or you know whatever entertainment and so it made me redefine who i was and how i approach my days yeah so even though i don't leave the house i don't leave the house as much as i used to i you know i find i find joy right in nature around me luckily you know even though i'm in the city i'm um i you know i when i bought my property i bought a smaller house bigger property yeah so i have three acres and i get all kinds of you know critters and wildlife that comes through but i'm in the city yeah. and so i i can find joy just in in my relationships and my my home and my animals and just enjoy myself. So I think the pandemic actually in a lot of ways was beneficial for me. It made me go internal versus external. So you got a lot of things that are going on in your life professionally. Mm -hmm. But if I put you in front of a, a bunch of third graders at career day and one of the kids says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? I would say what my dreams presented and I would let them know that I was never supposed to be academically strong. Um, I had learning challenges young. Um, I found a good mentor and I accomplished that. So for me, life is not just about a career. It's about excelling myself and what I wanted, what I am intended to be and following my own purpose. So a good example for me is even though I'm a best-selling author, that wasn't my first direct path. You know, I I I I really needed a, a mentor younger in English and math, and and so I wasn't even probably going to go to college if I hadn't found that mentor, and then ended up getting my associates, my bachelor's, my master's, my doctorate, and then started teaching at the college level. And then, you know, I realized I still had some um, work to do on myself. So that's when I'm like, you know, I really would like to do two things. One, accomplish writing a novel for myself because I love to read. But also, um, I wanted to accomplish presenting that novel in a way that made people think about their lives. And the book is a suspense novel, but at the same time, and it's called Crossroads for those people that don't know about it. Um, and it's about people that meet in unusual circumstances. In this case, it's a trial. You know, there's the jurors in the trial, there's the um, courtroom, and most of those are just about the trial. This is about the people. Yeah. And the winners and the losers and, you know, and how really there are no winners and losers because they're all just people trying to meddle their way through no matter what good or bad decisions they've made. So when you were in the third grade, what was your dream to grow up and become? A model. Okay. All right. Yep. I didn't think I needed brains. Right. Right. So talk to me a little bit about how these seeds of writing and just wanting to be an entrepreneur, how did all of these initially get planted? Are you originally from Indianapolis? I'm originally from a small community outside of um, Indianapolis called Noblesville. Okay. And if you would want to describe my family roots, you would say they'd been there since dirt. And that's basically true. Yeah. Um, I 
come from a line, I'm going to say, of storytellers. When I'm saying storytellers, I'm not talking about um, and entrepreneurs. I'm not talking about like telling lies, storytelling. I'm talking about when they told a story, people just got drawn into it. My my grandfather told a story about losing his job and not having a job in the depression. And it made you want to go look for a job in the depression. You know, it was just, it, it was just so engaging about how he got this job and he had no um, experience and how he did it. And I learned from those, from that um, experience of hearing people's stories that you could thrive. My same thing with my father. He started his own business in a bar, you know. So everything about my makeup is of that entrepreneurial, motivational kind of um, mentality and attitude. If it's meant to be, it's up to me. And I, it took a while for it to soak in because, I, like I said, I had challenges. So. For me, I, you know, I just thought that it should fall in my lap at first. But that I realized that if you put things in small increments and be prepared and be positive, you can accomplish whatever you want. So who's been a hero for you, an inspiration for you in your life and all these pursuits? Oh, well, different seasons for different people. Um, I'm going to say that in my junior year, the mentor that I found, um, her name was, it was a teacher. It was, her name was Mrs. Donnelly. And, she, and we had, to, I went to a private school. There was only 50 in my graduating class. And we had to, we had to um, pass a proficiency test for you to graduate. So they don't do that in, in the public school. But if you didn't pass, you didn't graduate. Yeah. And I was struggling and she said, I'm going to, I'm going to, tutor you over the summer. You're going to pass. And I so all summer long, I worked at Arby's. And so I could pay for it. And she tutored me. And then when it came time to pay her, I asked her how much I owed her. And she said, nothing, just pass the test. That changed my whole trajectory of life. Yeah. So then I was able to, you know, move and go to college and do some of the things that I always thought I, I I, I I wanted to do, and I'm the first female in my in my family to go to college, and that so that would be my first one. But as far as changing things, but my parents are my ultimate because they started from the grassroots and they created you know a life that you know most people you know dream of, and it was all through their hard work and them working together. Um, and I learned that you don't make it just on your own. Even the people around them, I could say, were there. Because, you know, I could say, for instance, there was a a man that my dad did business with that I was good friends with his um, daughter. And he would always say, if he made a, if he gave his word, you knew it was going to happen. And with having those examples that really made an impact on making me a stronger individual and realizing not only is it about my effort, it's about the people I surround myself with. So if you could meet one person alive on the planet that you find fascinating or inspirational, who would that be? Who would you love uh, to meet and talk to? If, who would I want to meet? That's a good question because there's so many awesome people out there in the world. Um, I think if I were going to want to meet one individual that's alive today, um, I would have to say I would want to meet probably, um, well, she's not alive though. I would really want to, would but want to meet the, um, a poet, but she's passed. So no, you can, you can pick it. You can pick a ghost. That's fine. <laughs> I would want to, um, the great poet of, um, Oh, now my my brain my, my brain went blank after you said that. Um, oh, we can circle back around. It's fine. Yeah, let's circle back around because yeah. all of a sudden I embarrassed myself and look at You're me. Fine. I, I, yeah. I'm full of words all the time and look what happened. It's <laughs> okay. It's all right. It, it's 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 the weird thing about life. So, what is your motivation every day? What gets you out of bed? What gets you to write? What gets you to create stories and be an entrepreneur and also evolve as a person? Internally, it's just my wanting to to have 
a legacy of of to to leave behind. So, like for instance, I pick projects. And when I was writing Crossroads, it was Crossroads. But right now, my my first thing in the morning with my coffee is genealogy and it, my history. And I I get up and I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to research. So it's my research and learning about the world. I'm a self learner. I like to learn. Um, anything and everything. I like to read anything and everything. So whatever my project is right now. So presently I'm working on um, the House of Hannah's, which is a um, book that was written in 1860s by um, one of my, my ancestors, but I'm trying to update it with a new um, volume of it that can be left in the Indiana State Library. Um, and then I also then have research for other people that I, I just, I just like research. I like learning new things. So I would say it's an internal desire to leave a footprint without anybody and everybody. It could be, yeah. you know, my neighbor, you know, it, so that, that's what gets me up every day and coffee. There you go. I, me too. So speaking of footprints, what's been one of the best fan letters you've ever gotten from your work? I would say I got, well, there was actually, there's two. One was from a podcast and the, it was a winner of one of my, um, my books. And she wrote to me just, and not only just about how much she enjoyed it, but how it made her think about her own relationships and how she's built. And another one came from an, el an elderly man that, that I uh, met at a book signing. And I had forgotten all, you know, you go on, you have your book signing and send a me message about how his wife had got it for me for or for him for his Christmas present. And he was like, I would never have thought so much about the places in Indiana. So the book setting is in Indiana. And I put history in there to allow people to look at the different locations differently so when someone's walking through the center of indianapolis and not only talks about what's going on in that person's life that was in 1983 but it's also talks about that particular spot in the 1800s and 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 what yeah. that monument meant to them when they built it and how things changed and how they reflection so I would say those were probably the most impactful because I realized, hey, they got it. Well, I take that back. There's one that might even trump those. And that was Meryl Hemingway. Yeah. She wrote she wrote a um the foreword for my book when she agreed to it, but then she did a review on YouTube. And it's called um, Meryl Hemingway Praises Rhonda Parker Taylor. And I when I I got goosebumps and chills when I listen to it because it I realized that even though it was a goal for me that I'd actually successfully told the story in a way because when she ends ends the um just going over what the book is at the end she gives her own reflection and about how it made her think about all the crossroads she's had in her life and then she ended it with, um, there's a point in time that everybody comes across that they have to realize that even chocolate has an expiration date. Yeah. And it really made me want to write more to reach more people because if, if we can make an impact just in one person's attitude or thought about how they build their lives or how they navigate the world, then then you know what? life would be a better place. I agree. So let's say you have a dream tonight. You run into the 18-year-old version, senior and high school version of you, and you could give that version of you a piece of advice based on the wisdom you've gained in your life up to this point. What advice would you impart on that young version? Find the lessons in life and, and learn from them. How many times do we play the game of uncle <laughs> with ourselves? Um, I would tell that 18-year-old, stop worrying about other people not not help people right but so many times in my life some of my downfalls was either I was putting too much into people that really didn't care that much for themselves about themselves or that I was worried more about the relationships than I was about myself yeah 
So that slowed some of my own personal progress because I was putting the emphasis on things that really didn't matter. You know, it mattered to me at the moment, but it 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 stopped my progress rather than than made me um, work on my own skills and learn from others and learn from my um, the lessons because we all are going to make mistakes. Yeah. But it's when you actually reflect on those mistakes to say, okay, you know, let's elevate myself and and my peer group. Yeah. So what of all of the things that you've done, overcome, accomplished, and become in your life, what are you the proudest of? Being a daughter, wife, sister. Um, I intentionally try to stay in touch and build relationships. You know, that's something that people sometimes don't realize how important it is because um what happens in life is people get busy and they don't always put the emphasis on the important things. And I can write without and still be a good sister. Yeah. I can sometimes I would in my younger years, I might have made it. So oh, I'm too busy. You know, that's, you know, to do this or go to this event and um, or maybe it was even a confidence issue at different points, you know, to be a mentor. But I would say that learning to be a good human is one of the biggest lessons that I, I could have ever um, learned. And even to, you know, even caring for my elderly parents, you know, at different points, um, I learned that life is about those moments and how you'd handle those moments. So everyone has a perception of you out there, family, friends, all of your fans, but ultimately you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Well, I would say that I'm my, their impressions may have been right <laughs> because their impression and my dad used to always say, it's like, you're like a damn butterfly that hops from flower to flower and doesn't, have, you know, and I do do that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I am a self-diagnosed ADHD person that goes from project to project, um, item to item, but I've learned to stay focused and I, and I'm not really diagnosed. That's my, that, and I realized that, um, the importance of not giving up and staying disciplined to what I want to get done. So I would say they were right. Yeah. But they had maybe missed the potential because of of my nature to want to socialize. Yeah. So at the end of the day, if anyone out there wants to get your books, learn more about you, reach out, what's the best way to do that? So I tried to make it easier for everybody. It's Rhonda Parker Taylor. Um, Rhonda's with an H dot com for my website. All of my social media is under Rhonda Parker Taylor. Um, my book's called Crossroads. I do have a copy if anybody wants to look at it. It's based out of Indianapolis. It's a um, suspense thriller, kind of like an Agatha Christie kind of feel, where it's the clue version of suspense versus the um, Kuntz or, um, or King version. And feel free to reach out. I'll be glad to answer back. Uh, you can get the book on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or a lot of the, or a lot of the Barnes and Noble bookstores. And I would love to hear from you. Excellent. Rhonda, this has been great. Thank you so much for your story, your passion, and your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Best you. of luck. Day. Absolutely. Thank you.